Welcome to The Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer and Micah Richards. And on this episode, um, we also have a special guest, um, very special actually, because he's been through uh, quite an ordeal in recent weeks. Uh, Micah's punch in the air um, because I think we're delighted that he's actually joining us. Um, Tom Lockyer from Luton. Um, good morning. Let me start, Tom, by asking you the obvious question. How are you? Um Tired, to be honest with you. This is um, this is the earliest I've been up in a while. Um, I know I've mentioned it before in a few other interviews, but <laughs> been expecting a little one, and um, she's arrived now, and and uh, it's changed my world. If I'm being honest, um, it does. <laughs> yeah, it's a complete different perspective on everything. So um, yeah, my eyeballs hate me at the minute, but um, I'm doing well, she, and she's doing well, which is which yeah. is the main thing. Well, many congratulations on that. Um, I suppose for your for your family, it's probably quite emotional than than normal um, having a child, um, considering what you've been through. Particularly, you know, it must have been very worrying for your partner uh, those times that you, you know, dad might not be around. Yes, and is not nice to happen at any time. But I think the first thought I had when I came round then was, you know, um, my missus is is watching in the stand, and she's seven months pregnant, and. Um, God knows how she's feeling, not being able to do anything, not being able to help. Um, and, and you know, is it going to affect the baby in any way? You know, stresses like that can can have adverse effects in, in certain ways. So it wasn't a very nice feeling to have at the time. But um, no, she seemed to, seemed to have um, handled it really well. <clears throat> and, um, and yeah, and it, it was amazing, amazing throughout the birth. So um, yeah, I can't speak highly enough of her. And, um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's almost given me a little bit different perspective, you know, that mm. before I was kind of a bit like, well, like football is, is the most important thing in the world. Like there's nothing better <laughs> than football playing, you know, working my whole career, trying to get to, to the Premier League, finally get there. I'm like, yeah, this is amazing. Football is the only thing that matters here. And, and then this, this little girl comes along and, you know, changes everything for me. Yeah, it, it certainly does, particularly the sleep pattern. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that never gets any better though I'm promise you sorry to be the bearer of bad news <laughs> but my daughter's 31 now 29 and 23 and the lack of sleep and the lack and the worry yeah. just, he's, he's always full of I'm good news he's always, he's always, <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, and well, the cost that, as well that, by that the way I'm sorry about that care. as well um, I think we all know what that's like um Tom, obviously this was the incident during, during the game was obviously the second time um, that had happened to you. Uh, what were the differences between when it happened in the playoff final and, and this particular incident? So the one in the playoff final, um, I, well, when I, I was running backwards and I felt really lightheaded and, and my legs went like jelly. And the next thing I remember is waking up from a dream and almost being aware of everything that happened straight away mm. it, it took like a second or two but i was i was i knew what had happened and and um and speaking to the physios and that and you know i never felt in in any trouble whatsoever it was just one of them things and i i was like i really wanted to play on obviously hindsight is a bit silly but um, that's how good I felt, you know. So, yeah. um, and that that turned out to be AF, which is um, which is not life threatening. So, um, yeah, completely different to the second time. The second time was was VF, which can be life threatening as as we yeah. were, were aware. Do you know that the, just for our, our, our listeners, AF is and VF is atrial fibrillation and ventricle fibrillation. I believe don't don't not hundred percent on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. please you ask that guys and then um, yeah so so the second one was life threatening and um, I remember going incredibly light headed this time again did you immediately think oh god no not again well the the since since it happened um, I had so there was um, a couple games before where I went light headed and I was like oh this is a bit of a weird feeling Mm. And 
the physios were like, well, get they get this um, loop recorder in. So this is like a little device that just sits under your chest and it just shows them constantly what your heart's doing. Because they were they couldn't be sure either way of what was going on. Um, and we'd been given the all clear from the specialists, so there was no reason for concern, but they were like, look, let's just double, let's be double safe on this one. Yeah. So I had that put under the skin and nothing was showing up. And I was going lightheaded a few times, but everything was normal. So when it happened at Bournemouth, in my head, I, as soon as I went lightheaded, I went, oh, I'll be fine in a second because that's what was happening before and nothing was showing up on this device. So I'm I'm walking up to the halfway line, uh, keeper kicks it, I start jogging up and I went incredibly lightheaded again. And I remember thinking, oh, I'll be fine in a second. Yeah. And that was the last thing I remember. And then I said in the playoff final, I woke up from a dream and... I was pretty aware this time I woke up. It was a nothingness. It was, it's hard to explain. It was just like nothing. And then I was, I was, I was there. And did you think at any stage, did you have a, a fear or were you to think you were dying or? Is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was a fear, Gaz. No, it was, um, uh, it was, it was a numbness. I was really numb to yeah. it all. It was, it's, it's hard to explain. And I don't know what that was but I woke up and I was I was trying to make aware of my surroundings try and work out what's going on um because I wasn't wasn't able to process that and I wasn't able to move I wasn't able to speak so but I could see that this time like the physios and the paramedics they were they were like in go mode it was it, it was serious I was I was having like the cannulas put in my arm um, but I could feel that, but I couldn't move or speak or respond. And they're saying, talk to me. Can you hear me? Blah, 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 all this. Um, and I can't, I'm just led there. And it was just a real numbness to the whole thing. And I remember just thinking, oh, I'm, I could be dying here. That was the thought I had um, from seeing it all. Because it was almost like a best way to describe it. It was like a movie where... <laughs> I don't know, there are movies where like, a big bomb goes off and then they wake up on the floor. And they're just yeah. like disorientated. That's exactly how it felt. And seeing everyone in the, it, I, I say panic. They were, they weren't panicked. They, they knew what they were doing. They were incredible. They saved my life. And, but they, but they were serious, you know, they, it was, it was like, this is serious. Do, do you know if it, the fact that you were playing football at the time was possibly the cause for it, along with obviously the VF issue that, that you actually had? Because I've often wondered um, about things like this have happened on football fields. If if they do, it's almost the best place for them to happen, isn't it? Because you've got medics around, you've got defibrillators, all that kind of uh, necessary stuff. And immediate, immediately ambulances will be there. Um, or or was it actually the fact that you were playing football with that condition that, that would have made that happen anyway? It's, it's too early to say the... The thing about these hearts is that it's not like pulling a hamstring where someone looks at a scan and goes, oh, you've pulled your hamstring. Yeah. There's, with these hearts, it's so minute and different ways and it's so complex and such a specialist thing that there's only a handful of people in the world who actually deal with these sorts of things. So it will come down, it won't be come down to, oh, this is, this is what you had. It will be, a specialist's theory on the matter saying look I've had a look at everything and it's still ongoing like there's there's a lot of a lot of top cardiologists in the world having a look at the case just to see how it goes and it's why everyone says can you can you get back to football it, it really is too early to say now um yeah. because of how complex the case is and and everything they've got to, got to try and discount or was this a factor was that a factor um so much more goes into it than you know, you've pulled your hamstring, you've got this. It's, yeah, it's I, a lot more I, complex. I suppose having had the all clear the first time, um, you'd be probably slightly more nervous um, if you got, even if you got the all clear, possibly because of the the fact that you've now got a family. Yeah, and it's something I've never, never had to factor in before, really. Um, I've always been pretty selfish in my decisions of, well, I'm going to join this club because it's best for me and my football and my career. And I didn't actually ever 
think, oh, well, what about, you know, at, at the time it was only, you know, my mum and dad and, and um, you know, obviously you, you, you fly the nest, you, you, you don't really worry about them too much, do you? So, um, <laughs> but now, now I know I've got a dependent. Obviously now you've got to look after yourself a little bit more. Are you allowed to train on your own? No, so this is the hardest thing is ever since that happened, so I got I got shot back to life on the pitch and two minutes 40 I was out for, that little device said. Um, but I got shot back to life on the pitch and that's supposed to leave, um, not like, but it's supposed to be a bit painful around the chest area, you know, you're supposed to feel it. But I woke up and I felt after... You know, I got off the pitch and was in the ambulance. I was like completely normal again. So the hardest thing for me is they said, look, you can't do anything until we get to the bottom of this. And because I feel so fine and normal within myself, that's probably the hardest bit is that I really want to go out and do some exercise or keep fit. And, you know, it's good for the for the mental health more than anything. Yeah. And I'm not allowed to do that. So mm -hmm. just been yeah. playing a lot of golf. But like we said, my old man's a bit, I went out on, um, on uh, my brother had an electric bike and I, I went round the corner on that, just trying it out. And my, my old man said, the, the second I left <laughs> round the corner, he said, he, he shit himself. He's, he's what are you doing? beside himself. Yeah, yeah, I know. And these are the things that, you you know, I don't even, I bet. you don't even think because, cause, you know, I feel so normal. Oh, going round the corner on a bike's no problem, but... Yeah, in, in terms of the safety bit, I think obviously I've had my device fitted now, so I'm probably safer than ever. Um, but it, there's a lot of other things that come with it. Tom, do you know um, you, the, the guys that that saved you basically? Um, were they were they the doctors and physios from the football club, or they were they in, uh, doctors from that were just at the uh, at, at the ground? And uh, if if so, have you kept in touch with them? Yeah, so the. The initial first responders were uh, the loot and physio and doc was straight on. Um, I was giving uh, was giving our doc a little bit of stick actually because he got smoked by the physio and um, he's uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's first over and, and he first prides himself. He says he says he's the fastest <laughs> at the club, right? And I say, well, these images these images say otherwise. Um, but yeah, yeah. So they were first over and then. Um, the, the paramedics were on and I think what happened was when I, they first came over, I was um, a little bit respondent um, and then kind of like groaning and that. And then I just flatlined and that's when they knew that they had to, the doc flipped me over, he, uh, the scissors at the top and the GPS vest, um, defib pads went on. And then from what I know is the defib pads they go on and they show you um, like a heart rate of, of what, what the patient's heart's doing. And our doc is, is obviously trained in that. And he, he recognized that it was VF, like we mentioned. Um, and the paramedics from, mm. I think, St. John's Ambulance, um, who were doing the Bournemouth game at the time, mm -hmm. uh, they were there. And um, there was a woman there who, who said, yeah, that's definitely VF, let's shock. And that's when they shot me. And um, I've obviously I've been in contact with um, all the Luton, and I've sent messages out to um, everyone else. Yeah. But uh, when we go down for the replay, the Bournemouth game, I'm hoping to get down and see them all in person and, and shake their hands and, and say thank you. Brilliant, great. Yeah, you just mentioned Tom that you have some think fitted. How does that work? Can you explain that to us, please? So I've actually got two things fitted. So after the first one where I said um, I was getting lightheaded and they didn't know what it was, I had like this little, it's, it's like a mini USB stick that just sits in the pec. Um, uh, it's hard to explain really. Um, it just sits under the skin and it just it's just a constant, um, sends back to the iPad that anyone with access can can look at and see what, exactly what my heart's doing and then after this happens so when you survive a, a cardiac arrest you get um a defib put in your side um some can go under the collar as well i know ericsson's got that one um, but mine's mine's sitting in my side and that's just purely on the fact that 
should something like this ever happen again, you wouldn't have to wait for someone to come CPR you and wait for a defib. This defib is clever enough now that if it sees your heart go into any sort of uh, irregularity, it will just shock you straight away. So yeah, incredible devices. And um, yeah, wow. yeah, one that I, I was joking with my yeah. mates the other day. I said, um, well, that means I'm going to live forever now. Like, <laughs> I, if I, I'm 80 on my deathbed and you know, I'm going to die of old age and the, well, the, the device, <laughs> The device sees your heart you stopping you. and then bosh, I'm back. <laughs> Goodness <laughs> me. Have, have you looked back at the, the, the footage of it, Tom? Uh. So the TV wise. Yeah, so our physio's got a wide angle of the whole thing. And um yeah, I was straight away I was pretty much all right, let's have a look then what actually happened. Um and it's a it's a it's a numbness to it all again. It's mm. It's hard to really draw any emotion from the whole thing. The the only time I've really had emotion to the whole thing was walking out at the Kenny um, before the Brighton game when all the fans gave me the reception, which was, I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. And it was kind of like, wow. like, And then, um, yeah, I don't know how I didn't cry. There. I definitely had tears in the eyes. Yeah. Really, real emotional stuff. I, I, I have to say, you kind of really disturbed my Saturday. <laughs> getting ready for match of the day and all of a sudden we had to rip up the running order <laughs> rewrite the opening all that sort of stuff I don't I want to appear selfish here Tom but be a bit more thoughtful <laughs> in the future please I apologise for that <laughs> <laughs> um, at the time I mean it was incredible in the oh, ground um, everything went deathly quiet um, everyone was ex- you know extremely worried including including ourselves we were watching the footage um, going out and I can't imagine what it must have been like for your family if they talked to you about that um so my old man was was at the game my missus was obviously at the game which I'm I'm really pleased he was because he's he's a real level head and um you know just he, he was able to look after my missus basically which was um which was a great thing but my mum and brother always listened to every game um, on the radio oh back home. And they were in the living room and obviously Bournemouth scored. And well, obviously my mum's gone out the room to make a brew and, and it's like, oh, that it was like Lockyer again's lost his man or whatever. And um, <laughs> and she's she's come back in the room and, uh, and my brother's turned off the, the radio and she's like, what's going on here? And... Uh, and he's had to say to her like, "Oh, Tom's like collapsed off the ball again," um, which obviously was 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 probably horrible for her to hear. Mm. Um, and yeah, be and just it just be helpless to the whole situation, so far away, not knowing what to do, not knowing if I'm okay. Um, that that's probably the the hardest thing that from the whole situation. They prob they probably heard at the, at the same time as as, as we did because um, we were obviously working on that um, Saturday afternoon. Um, so they were probably you know clinging to the radio at that point, or you or your dad and, um, and and your partner were were in the stands just not knowing what was going on. It must have been incredibly difficult for them. Yeah, and in a in a way, I almost feel sorry for everyone else who had to witness that and had to be in that eerily stadium and, you know, the quietness and what's going on, is he alive? You know, there was players praying. Whereas for me, I just lived it. I was like, I was lightheaded one yeah. minute. I woke up, I had, on the floor I had, you know, it, I don't know how long, it felt like five minutes. It probably was nowhere near that, but of of what what's going on, this is not very nice. But then after that, I'm in the ambulance and I'm fine again. And, yeah. you know, it was... It's, I almost feel so sorry for everyone who had to watch that, and which is why I think it's nice I'd get to go back for the replay game and just just thank them all um, and apologise. I know I, I you can't... really don't need to apologise, Tom. I, I know, but <laughs> yeah, like, what, thank them, I guess. Then um, what 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 about yourself? What geez, what are you hoping incredible. for in terms of when they do the tests, the medical things like that? Is your dream still to play again? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, well, it's 
it obviously is it's way too early to say. Oh, I mean, ultimately, we'll be led off the specialist advice. I just think I've I've worked all the my... fact that you got that specialist advice before and they said you were all fine and you could play. Would would that kind of lessen your your faith in in what they say? Uh, no, no. The the way I see it is this this happened once. Like they the if they let me go back now, there yeah. is no doubt in their mind that mm. I'll be okay. Yeah. Like because this has happened once after saying I've got the okay. If this happens again, you know that that's you know that that's that's on them, isn't it? So yeah. Um, they, they, there's no way if there's any sliver of doubt, I don't think they would let me play. So um, yeah, if there is a chance to play again, I would love to. I think obviously I've worked my whole career to try and reach the top. You know, I was playing non-league, League Two, League One, Championship. Finally, get to Premier League, get the taste of the good life. Mika, I see Mika not in there. Get the taste of the good life. <laughs> <laughs> he just burst onto the scene, Tom. That didn't happen to him. As soon as you mention good life, that's when he gets excited. I, I just had that taste, and I just want more of it. It's, yeah. um, it's so good, but yeah, it, it, it's out of my hands, unfortunately, and I will ultimately be led by, by whatever they say. You said you come through the leagues. What was it like when you heard the match of the day music for the first time? You know, <laughs> analysing Luton. Did it get you excited? <laughs> <laughs> it was crap until we seen you were on the show. No, his um, first game of the season was um, Brighton away, and we lost four one. And I was like, "Oh fuck, we're gonna get hammered here." So, <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, brilliant. Let's talk a little bit about. Um, your career, Premier League football, it's what you aspired to um, for many, many years, Tom. What was the major difference between Premier League football and lower league football? Um, just the, the quality of players, the the ruthlessness in front of goal. You know, you give a chance away nine times out of ten, it's getting punished. You might get away with a couple of mistakes in the lower leagues, but, you know, it's, it's, it's ruthless. We've seen that the other day when when Haaland was getting his chances, I know he's had a little bit of stick recently, but oh my God, it, <laughs> he, he came to the Kenny and um, he got clapped off by um, half the Luton fans, which um, mm. <laughs> they're a rowdy bench at the best of times. So <laughs> that just shows you the type of uh, a player that you're up against. This um, It really is incredible and a bit surreal, to be honest, you know, when you come from these lower leagues that, you know, I think, I think there was a lot of that with Luton that, when we first went there, it was a kind of like, wow, like this is amazing. Look at all these players. Um, probably gave the league a little bit too much respect um, and came away from what we wanted to do. But yeah, slowly got back to that. Yeah. And it was, I, I mean, you get punished obviously uh, in the Premier League, but you've, you know, Luton are doing better, considerably better than certainly Burnley and Sheffield United, the two clubs that were automatically promoted yeah. um, could you envisage the, the the fact that you'd be above them and and still in obviously with a with a reasonable chance of, of staying up and it, obviously that could be dependent on points deductions and etc but uh, we'll wait and see on that yeah I think before the season the goal was always to stay in the league um, we yeah we we knew Luton weren't going to go out and spend millions on players it's just never been the way that that we've done things. So there's always going to be cute signings in the market. Um, and throughout my time at Luton, them signings have always done really well. Um, obviously, you're not going to get them right all the time. But I think when we were bringing people in this season, people were going, oh, he's coming from League One. He's a championship player. What's he doing with him? You smiling, Mika? Were you saying that? Were you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> um, but but the, the the main thing at the club is like, it's it's so weird to say. It's just like the strength is like the togetherness of everyone instead of like the individual talents. You know, obviously we've signed Ross Barkley, who is is a, is an incredible individual talent, and we do have great individual players, but. As a collective, that's that's where the real strength comes from. So we knew we were always going to have that fight in us. 
it's just the it's just the Luton DNA. You look at the history of the of Luton, that's, the fight is always there, um, and 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 that that would never change. But we knew this this was going to be such a harder task than getting promoted last year. I played in an era, um, Tom, before you were born, <laughs> uh, when Luton were. A- you know, they were a top side. I think they finished top half in the old first division, what you call now the Premier League, um, three times. I'd like, um, they have Mal Donaghy, Brian Steen, people like that. Paul Walsh was around um, at, at that stage. Um, Mick Harford. Mick Harford, of, of yeah. course, who's now very much present at, at, at Luton Games, etc. And they were one Steve of... Steve you know, Foster. Steve Foster was was there, yeah. Um, so it, All right, Alan, on your Google. Yeah. <laughs> Alan's, Alan's nearly as old as me, Micah. Don't forget that. So he, he can remember. But I'm, not that old. I'm, I'm sure for most of you fans, though, they wouldn't have seen um, top flight football before. You need to have been a certain age, um, is, is the point that I'm, I'm getting to. So um, I suppose in many ways it, it must be a thrill for the fans, but it's, it's also quite difficult because it, it's hard to grind out results, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I, th- I think you mentioned that, but it was the. Luton got relegated the season before the Premiership formed. So we did. Yeah. We're one of the founders of the Premier League, but never actually played in it. So this was a uh, first time in the Premier League for the club, which obviously is amazing. Um, I think the fans, yes, they do they want to be winning every week? Yeah, of course. Um, but they appreciate that we're Luton and we're going to do mm. it our own way. The club got into financial difficulty before and the people who run it now, you know, you you speak, you have five minutes with them, you know that they're, they're never going to let the club get to that position again. So we're never going to spend beyond our means. We're always going to try and do it our own way. And it it, it will be, it will be tough. Um, but the fans, they, they get to see, you know, Erling Haaland coming into the Kenny, um, Man United's, Liverpool's. Um, and these games, these atmospheres, they're, they're incredible to be a part of. And the fans really really get behind us with these and I think it's great for them you know they've come from really like Barrow Dartford and Telford and all these clubs and that and now they, they they've stuck through the tough times and they're getting Liverpool's and Man City so I think it's incredible yeah. was there an excitement in the dressing room about it all at the start of the season and the play do the players talk like that oh crikey we've got Manchester City today we're at, we're at Liverpool we're going to Anfield or Old Trafford or yeah, Did they I talk think, like that at all? Yeah, yeah. So, like, when we went to Old Trafford and um, before the game, you obviously go out and have a look at the pitch. Um, sometimes you don't even bother if you're at, you know, um, lesser lesser grounds. But, um, yeah, well, at Old Trafford, I think everyone was out there. Um, no one was in the changing rooms and everyone was just like, this is, this is incredible, isn't it? Like, it's like what you said. A lot of us have come from the lower leagues and... Non leagues, non league exactly, and um, you just think part of the journey, and you you end up playing at Old Trafford. It's it, it's just it's surreal, man. It, it's so good. Who were your heroes growing up, Tom? Um, and don't say Alan. I, I, <laughs> I didn't want to be horrible, but it ain't you, me, Gariba. Uh, um, <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, I was, uh, I think I was um, John Terry and Frank Lampard. I was, I had a little yeah. bit of a Chelsea pull. Um, you were a Chelsea fan, right? Were you? Yeah, I was a Chelsea fan growing up. My old man was. But you were in Cardiff, weren't you? Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, but <laughs> when they released me, I um, I cut ties with them. They um, uh... yeah, <laughs> shot out my dreams, didn't they? Well, you got to drink. You got to drink. You were too small as a centre half, weren't you? Is that why they released you? Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't grow until. Until I was seventeen, eighteen, so <laughs> they just said, they just said, not big enough, not strong enough. So, um, oh. yeah, shattering, dream shattering. Proved them wrong, though. It takes some fight, though, getting released, being told you're not good enough, and then fighting back throughout the leagues to get back to the Premier League. That takes some character. Yeah, I think my mentality is probably my, my strongest, the strongest bit of me as an athlete. When they said to me, you're not big enough, you're not strong enough to play centre-half, it wasn't, uh, oh, all right, then let's let's pack this in. It was, uh, all right, I'll 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 prove you wrong. Um, mm. And that was my thingy. So I was like, okay, well, I can't help, can't help the height side of it. That will come naturally or it won't. 
But what I can do is the strength. You say I'm not strong enough. Okay, then, well, I'm going to start going to the gym three, four, five times a week um, and, 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 and doing everything I can in that sense. And, you know, once I did get released, it was a, all right, cool. That's one person's opinion. But I, I beg to differ that, you know, mm. my opinion is, well, I am good enough. And when I do grow and I am going to work on my strength, I'll be fine. What advice would you give to to young players? Because it, it obviously happens to you know thousands of thousands of, of youngsters every year um, that clubs t- have to say to them, well, you know, you're not quite got what it takes. You're not quite big enough. You're not quite good enough, or what, whatever it may be. Having had to deal with that, what would your advice to to young players in a similar situation be? Just, I think, just believe in yourself. The the self confidence that you need you. You almost need a bit of an ego to to play in football. I think you need, mm. you know, with, without there's a borderline with the arrogance side, isn't there? But you almost need that such self belief, like unwavering belief that you know you are good enough, you are capable of being there. Because throughout your career, you're gonna you're gonna go through bad times, and it, it's hard to come out the other side of them, especially when you're getting hammered. Oh, you're not good enough, you know, blah blah blah. And you know, I've had that. I've had that in league too. So. That that that's that's tough, and you know you 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 get relegated from League Two, and you're like, well, oh, I'm I'm thinking oh, I'm 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 better than this, but we just got relegated, and I'm getting hammered, and you know, so you need that you need that belief to say, you know what, I'm I am better than this. Just keep believing, keep believing in yourself, and and, and keep going. Health health issues aside, um, would that have been your lowest point as a footballer? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was my first season as um, as a professional. I came through and done two years uh, youth team, and then um, my first year as a pro, we get relegated out of the league, and I play play forty games in it. So I feel like I've, I've played, you know, my hand in relegation. And at the time, it was really hard to deal with. I remember coming back to Cardiff to my parents' house, and you know, just locked myself in my room for three, four days. Didn't want to didn't want to see it you know think the world's ending it's all my fault and looking back now it wasn't my fault at all um there's a lot more things going on and mm. but you don't see that at the time you just because you live and breathe football you you your beeline you're focused and um you know I'm doing every little thing I can to try and get the best out of me to perform the best on the weekend I'm I'm eating right I'm I'm in bed by half nine every night I'm you know I'm just ultra focused and at the end of it you get relegated that's that's a tough one to take. Mm. When mm. when did things start to turn to the good for you? Things start to go well. When did you think, well, actually, I'm going in the right direction now? I think when Daryl Clark took over at Bristol Rovers. So we got relegated out, out of League Two and, and he took over that year. And he met with me in the summer. And he said to me, because um, there was... Uh, there was um, there was talk of me going somewhere else and he said he said look I don't know where you're going to play for me but I know every team needs a Tom Lockyer and you're going to be a big part of us going forward here and that was the first time that someone else had shown more faith and belief in me than I had in myself and that was that was powerful he was like I don't know where you're going to play, but you are going to be in my team somewhere because because we need you. <laughs> so I'm sat there. I'm I'm on the back of the disappointment of relegation, and that just gave me that that boost to like, wow, this is you know I I want to play for this guy. I want to I want to prove him right. And and then a year later, he makes me captain. He says he says everyone looks up to you in the in the changing rooms. You lead by example on and off the pitch. Um, You've, you've you've found your voice now, and um, I want to make you captain. And and you know, and then he's just put that belief in me again a year later, and, and we go back to back promotions up to League One, and that's when I think the, the turning point in my career was. Yeah, you, you mentioned mm-hmm. there the fact that he didn't know whereabouts in the side you would play. Were, were you pretty much a utility player in, in in those days before you found your actual role? Yeah, and that was that was probably my biggest concern at the time was. I was I was playing and I loved playing, but it was I was a jack of all trades and a master of none, and I was fitting in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was fitting in right back. I was centre mid. I I played everywhere apart from striker and goalie, um, 
So he he wasn't wrong when he said every team, he, every one of his team yeah. needs a Tom Lockyer because he played me everywhere. But um, yeah, it wasn't until um, till we got promoted to League Two when I, I started nailing down uh, centre back then, and he said, "Look, you're gonna be you're gonna be a centre back now," and and I was like, "Oh, perfect, that that suits me." I know you, I, I know you chuckled slightly there the fact that you you played all all positions but I've often thought when I see utility players those kind of players that do play everywhere that are really important for a side I think your overall career can suffer a little bit for that because people you know they generally in the transfer market for example will target someone in a given position wouldn't they Yeah and that that was that was my main concern over it all I think looking at it now I think the the understanding of football of of being able to play these these certain positions is um you have it has to be quite high to do these roles you mm. know how the manager wants and and pick up what's needed from a you know a left wing where I've never played left wing in my life and he says you're going to do a job <laughs> for me out there today and you know I've got a, and that's where I you know that's where I score my first ever league goal from um left wing at the back post you know one of <laughs> the old Alan Shearer and um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, the, that, that that was my big concern was look, I I could end up just floating about and and just covering people left, right, and centre without actually having a position for myself. So when everyone's fit, am I going to play? Um, and that that was my main concern. So when I finally got a chance to nail down centre half, you know, I was buzzing. Um, wh- when did you sense um, at your time at Luton Town that they were heading in the right direction and possibility of Premier League football in the second year? I was there. So the first year we finished uh, top 10. Yeah. And next year it was a um, real kick. We went to playoffs and we, we lost to Huddersfield in the, in the semi semifinals mm-hmm. of the playoffs. And it was, it was like, a, it was so close yet so far. We, we were so heavily dependent on our one striker, Adebayo, and he got injured just before the, yeah. the playoffs. And, it was uh right we we've we've got the core we just need to just add to it a little bit and that's what that's what we done the next year then we you know we brought in Carlton Morris who who ends up getting 20 goals um a little bit more experience and um and yeah it was uh it was fairly early on then we went on a bit of a run and and we thought you know we we could we could really do this and then Rob Edward Nathan Jones leaves. Rob Edwards comes in, and and I think that was um, that was very pivotal as well. Yeah, it leaves me on nasty to Rob Edwards, which was going to be my next question anyway. Um, um, what's his skills and um, his strengths in terms of management? He's done an excellent job. Well, the man management side is incredible. I think you can see that he is just such a genuine human mm. being. It's um, it's really refreshing in football, actually. Because a lot of a lot of people are almost like robots now, like like win win or lose, we you know we just need we need results. Um, but he he shows that he shows that emotional side to him that you know he cares for his players and um, he's got a family first ethos in the building that you know nothing comes before family and we've almost created that as well that we are a family as well at Luton Town. So yeah, um, yeah he makes you want to run through brick walls for him and. Honestly, I I could spend hours talking about how great he is, um, and um, yeah, he, he 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 wants he gets everyone playing for each other and for him. Tom, is there is there any part of your squad, and it has ever been mentioned that you've got one eye on Everton and Forest because of what may or may not happen to to them in the coming months in terms of a points reduction? I'd be lying if yeah, I'd be lying if we said we haven't talked about it, but. It's it's one of them. Like you, until we see something in the news, or and even with um, with Everton, you know they had ten points off. It's down to six now, isn't it? So nothing's yeah. given. Um, well, thanks for being honest about that, Tom. I was fully expecting the answer there. Well, it's out of our control. All we can do is concentrate on our results, which is, <laughs> I'm sure, the the, the 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 answer to that question normally. So thank you very much for your honesty. It, because it, football, football, we all know you're little. talking about it. <laughs> No, of course it gets mentioned. Yeah. Um, you, you see what's going on in the news. You're like, well, are they? Are they? Have they broken financial yeah. fair play? Who knows? Um, and and that and that and that just goes on to what you just said. Like, 
we have to try and work to 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 finish ahead of them without any points deducted. Obviously, I, I'll be honest, I don't care how we stay up. If they, if they, <laughs> if they both get stripped 100 points, I'll be buzzing. That's right. Um, <laughs> like, it, it doesn't bother me, honestly. Um, but we've just got to finish above them. So whether they get points to help us deducted or not, you know, the, the, we've just got to try and finish above them. Forest fans, Everton fans, please take no offence. It's, no, <laughs> it's not it's not personal at your club. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely sure of that. I think you've done particularly well, um, not necessarily results-wise, but I think against some of the top teams in the Premier League this season, some of the giants, um, you've really ran them close. Yeah, we have. They've been good games, but you want to try and take points out of them. You don't want to be unlucky losers who come in the change rooms after and go, oh, we've done really well today, but you know there's no points on the board again. Uh, and we don't want to just turn up and go, oh, there you are, Man City, have three points. Um, we want to give them a game, but we also want to try and get some results from them, which I think we've struggled. Um, to. I think it's one point, is it, out of the from the top six, the games yeah. we've played. So just shows the, the, the level of quality, you know, we, we, we can run them close, but they always seem to just edge us out. Um, and, and Having said that, you know, you, you say we, we, we only got the one point up from those particular games, but if you look at Sheffield United and Burnley, the two teams that automatically promoted, they've been absolutely smashed and hammered by a lot of these sides. Yeah. That, that, and that's the, that's the level of quality that, you know, the, I always think that that top six, seven, um, are just are just so much, so much further in their in their football development than than the than the rest of the clubs, and especially that them coming up from the championship, the 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 gap to that that eight from from where we were last year is just it's just, it's frightening to be honest. Yeah, can you see them that that bigger difference between championship football and Premier League football? Yeah, yeah. The 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 thing with um. With the Premier League, especially, we found as well. Like, we're, obviously, we've gone back to to pressing, and and we like our our, our all out of press. Um, but everyone's just so much more comfortable on the ball in the Premier League. If you go pressing in in the Championship, nine times out of ten, you get it back. Obviously, you've got your Southamptons who uh, and and teams like that who will be able to handle it and 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 play through you at times. But that's um, <laughs> yeah, that's most teams in the Premier League. He talked about quality in the Premier League. What about Alfie Doughty? His delivery is outstanding. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. Is um, it's 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 on the money every time, isn't it? So, but when you've got when you've got strikers like Carlton Morris and 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 Elijah, that that is exactly what they want. They don't want you doing twenty five stepovers and and cutting back and and um, they want Alan, that wall Alan's in the box. Nodding. Yeah. I'm right as well. Absolutely, <laughs> couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, I was, I was saying like when, when, when I go up for a corner and the ball gets recycled, and you think it's going to come back in, so you make a run, and then oh no, he's done a step over. So okay, I'll move again. He does another step over. Oh, oh okay. In the end, I'm knackered. I'm like, yeah. I can't even be. I'll, I'll just run back to you. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to life as a centre forward. <laughs> yeah. To be fair though, but when it does come off, you get all the glory. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it's um... so going into the the last part of the, the season now. Um, do you think Luke, Luton can do it? Can they stay up? Which would be a massive achievement, really. Yeah, it'll be it'll be incredible achievement. Um, I think so. It's gonna need. It's gonna need. I don't know what we're gonna look at here. Um, yeah, there's. It's gonna be difficult, but um, if anyone can do it, Rob Edwards can 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 do it. I believe so. Um, like we mentioned earlier, hopefully we get some help with some points, but. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure we'll be planning that, that that nothing's going to happen, and we're going to have to just try and uh, do it normally. Uh, are you around the club at the moment, Tom? Are you going in daily, or are you just? Is that too difficult to do? No. Um, it's the, the the weird thing was I was speaking to Rob the other day about it. Actually, it's like after it happened, the boys went on a run, and um, we won quite a few games um, in a, in a period of games. Mm. And for me, that was. That was so easy to watch. Um, I was loving it. I was, the feeling was so good and everything. And I know I was buzzing to see the lads doing well. And 
now on the flip, when we've had a few sticky results and I feel like I can, if I was there, I could be helping the boys and I would be organising or that goal wouldn't have happened because, yeah. you know, that's that's when it's really hard for me is yeah. to, to see it and like, oh, I could have helped out there or, <laughs> you know, I would have pulled him in so there wouldn't have been that gap and then that goal wouldn't have happened. And, mm. and, and that's when that's when it's really hard. So, um no, I haven't been in too much. Um, obviously, the baby's come along now as well. Um, don't don't have the uh, the energy at the minute, but um, <laughs> yeah, when 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 things settle down a little bit, hopefully, I can try and get in a little bit more. Well, Tom, thanks very much mm-hmm. for your um, time. Very generous of you, and um, um, well done and well handled this whole thing. I think it's worth saying that you know, and and the club as well, Luton Town. I yeah. think the way they handled the whole thing and Rob Edwards was was amazing. Um, we wish you continued success for the club for the for the rest of the season and um, and stay healthy, Tom. <laughs> stay healthy because that's the most important thing, and you and your family. And uh, hopefully one day you'll you'll get back to kicking a, a football around. We um, appreciate thank- your time, man. Thank you. Oh, you might become a pundit. Come and join Big Meeks and the crew. <laughs> you got to look after me. <laughs> Absolutely. Always look after me. <laughs> Mike looks after everyone. He, he really does. <laughs> Tom, thank you so much. Um, yeah. um, we wish you all the best. Um, that's it um, for, for this episode. A very special one. Um, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Thanks, Tom. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. 